Welcome to the Taxpayer Podcast, a podcast production by the taxpayer. For more informative discussion on tax law, please visit our website to learn more about the Taxpayer Journal. Hello, Peter. Nice to see you again. Hi, um, Nice to be doing a podcast together. Um, our topic today is just one rather substantial case, in, in my opinion, and uh, that refers not just to the importance of it, but also to the size and length of it. And that is the long-awaited judgment in the Thistle case. Mm-hmm. Uh, another matter was argued on the 8th of February, and judgment was handed down on the 2nd of October. So that did indeed take a long time. The The case was argued actually a week before the coronation thing, but the coronation judgment came mm-hmm. out first. Uh, once one get, reads the judgment, I think one can appreciate why it took so long, because there was a dissenting judgment. Um, maybe I should disclose the fact that I acted in the case. Uh, <laughs> I was, I was, I did the, uh, the matter in the tax court alone, and we were successful in front of Judge Wright in Johannesburg Court, although that was done remotely. And it's the most, uh, I re- we received the judgment two days after the hearings, the quickest I've ever experienced. And then he found in our favor, relying on Section 25B, is it 25B of the mm-hmm. Income Tax Act, um, the, which deems income uh, to accrue, to, or amounts to accrue to, to um, beneficiaries of trusts, mm-hmm. um, et cetera. I'll come to the facts in a moment. Um, SARS got leave to appeal, quite rightly so, and and the matter went to the Supreme Court of Appeal, where I appeared again, and we lost the case there. And we were very unhappy with the judgment, and I think a lot of people were as well. And then the matter went to the Supreme Court of Appeal, and um, Vim Trengrove um, was the leading counsel there, and I was assisting him, um, together with two others as well, so it was taken very seriously. And um, I have nothing but the highest of praises to sing for for them. He he he, mm-hmm. he just presented the case in such a simple, elegant way. Um, it's a it's a model of good advocacy. Uh, and then we waited and waited and waited, and judgment came out. So I'm telling you that I, my, of my own involvement, just so that um, you know, I, I don't think I take any of this personally. But we lost. So the, the there was a split judgment. Um, acting Justice Chaskelson, son of the former Chief Justice, wrote the majority judgment, and he had um, six judges or five judges concurring with him, and uh, and then uh, also acting Justice Bilchitz, um wrote a dissenting judgment, and he had Judge Madlanga, who I've always regarded as one of the best <laughs> constitutional court judges, concurring with him. So it was six judges to two. If you add those up, it comes to eight. Uh, a, a feature of the case was that the, the there were only eight judges, and Madlanga was the, was the most senior judge. Uh, and he called us in and said, look, if you want to postpone it to another date, He's open to that because if 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 the judges are split for for all, then we have to lose because then there'd be no judgment of the constitutional court. Anyway, Vim decided to to go ahead, so we went ahead and we lost six two. Um, I've got very strong views on on the case, and and if I may just say this, I, it, it's not whether one wins or or loses; it's 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 how one wins or loses. And in in my opinion, and Peter and I haven't discussed this before, so I have no idea what your what your views on the case are. Um, but firstly, the, the 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 and I'll deal with the facts in a moment. Although probably most people know what they are, um, the majority judgment held that uh, paragraph eighty two of the eighth schedule. To the Income Tax Act, which deals with with capital gains tax, um, required uh, the CGT to be paid by the beneficiary of the trust that sold the asset. 
paragraph 82 deals with a situation where an asset has been sold and then the proceeds are distributed and it's the beneficiary that has to pay the tax. Um, what The facts of the case were there was a group of trusts which were referred to as Zen Prop, um, and they owned and developed property, um, and uh, the taxpayer, Th the Thistle Trust, was a vested beneficiary of that trust. Um, the Zen Prop Trust sold certain property, and the Thistle Trust received it, its share of the proceeds as of right, because it had vested rights, and it then distributed those um, that capital gain to its beneficiaries, who paid the tax on it. Um, so the, the, the debate was not about whether capital gains tax had to be paid, it was about who was liable for it. And SARS said, no, the Thistle Trust was liable for it, not the ultimate beneficiaries. And that's what the case was all about. Um, so the majority judgment interpreted section 82 in such a way that um, the it was the beneficiary of the trust that disposed of the asset that had to pay the, the tax. A lot of what the case was about was the conduit principle, the conduit pipe principle, uh, which was introduced into our law in the Armstrong case and then in the Rosen case. Um, and the conduit pipe principle is that where a trust distributes an amount to a beneficiary in the same year in which it arises, um, the trust merely acts as a conduit and the, the amount in question flows through the trust to the beneficiary. Um, and the accrual is recognized for the first time in the hands of the beneficiary and the amount retains its character. And uh, the taxpayer relied on that principle and then also on um, its own interpretation of paragraph 82. Um, so the taxpayer lost on that aspect. The dissenting judgment would have found in favor of the taxpayer. And, and we can turn to the dissenting judgment in a moment. Um, where the, all the judges were unanimous was on the question of understatement penalties. Now, um, in the tax court, understatement penalties didn't arise because the court found in favor of the taxpayer, so, so there was no understatement. In the SCA, um, the court found in favor of SARS, so then they felt that there was there had been an understatement. Um, and then, so they, that court had to deal for the first time with understatement penalties. And I was in that case, and I was present in court. Um, and my version, I wasn't keeping notes of this, but my very clear recollection, recollection of what happened was that um, one of the judges, uh, if I think hard enough, I'll remember his name, uh, said to Sars's counsel, said, said Mr. So-and-so, uh, on the question of penalties, Mr. Emsley is obviously correct, is he not? And I can't remember the exact words of the opposing counsel, but he, it, it was something along, I can't take the point any further, which in my opinion in, in legal language is you're basically throwing in the towel. You know, you, you can't take it any further. You don't actually withdraw what you've said in your written heads of argument, but, you, but you're not pressing the point. So in their judgment, they said that SARS had conceded the question of penalties. Now, when the matter went to the Constitutional Court, um, SARS denied that they'd conceded that. And, um, you know, I, I happen to have been there, so I can talk about it, but I'm not necessarily claiming to be omniscient or anything like that. Um, we can deal in a moment with what the court said on the question of penalties. Um, but they, they, they found that um, there was no basis whatsoever for SARS to have claimed an understatement penalty. So that, that certainly is a unanimous aspect of the judgment. Um, for the rest, I think the dissenting judgment of Judge Bilchitz uh, is an absolutely brilliant judgment. I really do. And I can, I can, I can tell you ad nauseum why I think that's the case. But he adopted a really... Um, constitution-centered um, approach to the whole thing, to the interpretation of statutes, to the rule of law, to the uh, contra fiscum rule, 
um, to all sorts of things, and he dealt with it very, very comprehensively. And I, I, you know, I, that's why I said which side I, I appeared on. So, so maybe I'm, I'm not unbiased, but I really take my hat off to him. I think it's an absolutely brilliant judgment. And and in in a short note that I've written for the taxpayer, I've I've, I've gone out on a limb and said I predict that this judgment of Bullshit's will be like the dissenting judgment of Judge Corbett in the Elon Seville case. He was a lone, a lone voice in that case. But if you look at whenever Elon Seville is cited as authority in subsequent cases, it's always Corbett's judgment that is cited. So today's dissenting judgment can be tomorrow's majority judgment or even unanimous judgment. Um, and I think it was very good. I've done enough talking, Peter, what do you think? <laughs> Thanks, Trevor. Just picking up some of your points, for me, the first aspect is it's quite interesting how the tax court, the SCA and the Constitutional Court can all hear the same matter and all come up with a different different reasoned judgment. Um, I mean, the Supreme Court of Appeal and the Constitutional Court both found in favour of SARS before somewhat different reasons, and the tax court, as you said, found in favour of the taxpayer, so that in itself is quite interesting. Um, the constitutional court judgment, I thought an interesting part of that is how it dealt with, as you said, the conduit principle. And it basically said there are two provisions it needs to look at, uh, paragraph 80, subparagraph 2, and then section 25, capital B. And section 25, capital B, it basically just dismissed that section completely and said that just doesn't apply because that applies effectively to income. And paragraph 80, subparagraph 2, applies to capital gains. So it really focused only on paragraph 80, subparagraph 2. And it said uh, that that provision basically allows for the, for the flow through of capital gains in certain circumstances. And the circumstances, as you said, Trevor, require the alia that the trust disposed of an asset. And it said, yeah, that this old trust just didn't dispose of an asset. Uh, that as it was disposed of at the Zen prop trust level, as, as you mentioned. So 80, uh, paragraph 2 provisions aren't met, and therefore the capital gain doesn't flow through to the beneficiaries, and therefore by implication it's taxed in the trust. Um, and one of the interesting aspects for me on that is it referred to the explanatory memorandum in 2008, where the provisions of paragraph 80, subparagraph 2, were changed to require the disposal of an asset by a trust. And they said that change was fundamental. And they looked at the explanatory memorandum and said part of the rationale for that change was that you can't flow capital gains to what they called multi tiered trust structures. So interesting point, Trevor, and we've spoken about that, how you can look at explanatory memoranda in interpreting uh, statutory provisions. And the court directly referred to the Clix case or the new Clix case in 2005 um, uh, as precedent for that. But it also interestingly said there's a limit on the extent to which you can look at explanatory memoranda. For example, uh, law needs to be accessible to everyone. So if the explanatory memorandum was written decades earlier and somebody has to really scratch around to find it, then they said in those circumstances, maybe you wouldn't attach too much weight to the explanatory memorandum's statements. That obviously wasn't the case here. So it attached a lot of weight to the explanatory memorandum and completely disregarded Section 25, capital B, which driven your tax court case. That, that was the fundamental provision that the tax court looked at and and found that an amount in Section 25B could include a capital gain, and therefore a capital gain could flow through a, a trust um, to, to a beneficiary, regardless of the provisions of paragraph 80, subparagraph 2. And the court seemed to just not consider the fact that, which I think is fundamental, Section 25, capital B, was itself amended state in terms that it excludes the flow through principle in relation to capital gains. Mm. Now, if, if, if capital gains were never part of Section 25B, why on earth would it be changed to exclude them specifically? And obviously, the fiscal trust, trust matter occurred before that amendment, but that just wasn't dealt with, Trevor. What do you think? Yeah. To me, that's uh, an important uh, point. 
the minority judgment did, did say that that amendment to 25B and 82 happened at the same time, and they must be read in harmony. Oh. <laughs> just another majority can just ignore the amendment to 25B and, and say, well, 25B could, almost implies that it could never apply to capital gains, but it was amended to specifically exclude capital gains. So, I, I again, I think that's a gap. And I said this in our podcast when we <laughs> looked at the SCA judgment. I just found that that's a, a peculiarity in relation to these, uh, these, these, these judgments. Certainly, the SCA and the Constitutional Court one. Yeah. Um, I, I think also just contrafiscum. Remember, remember contrafiscum. <laughs> this one, you don't even talk about that anymore. <laughs> the, the sort of the presumption against the state or against the fisc and the majority judgment held that, well, for contra fiscum to apply, there needs to be ambiguity. And it just said there's no ambiguity in terms of paragraph 80, subparagraph 2, so you can't have recourse to that, to that rule, whereas Judge Bilchitz um, had rather a different view on that. Yeah, I mean, I think the contra fiscum rule has got a new shot in the arm from, from, uh, <laughs> from the from the dis dissenting judgment, certainly. Um, okay. Can I mention one aspect which which neither judgment even mentioned, mm. and, and uh, you know one can discuss whether it's relevant or not. But uh, I think both both judgments uh, accepted that that the that paragraph eighty two of the eighth schedule was intended to embody the conduit principle. The question was, did it have to be the trust that sold the asset that that um, its beneficiaries must pay the tax? Um, but what nobody picked up on was the fact that paragraph 82 only refers to residents. What about beneficiaries that are non-residents? What about them and the conduit principle? Not a word is said about that. Okay, mm -hmm. was, it, they weren't the facts, so the court didn't have to. But one wonders whether it shouldn't have been something taken into account in construing uh, the facts on, you know, the, the law that as it applies to the, the actual facts of this matter. And those are the most of the matters we're dealing with, Peter, are where, there, where there's a South African trust and it disposes of an asset and it realizes a capital gain and it best and distributes that capital gain to a non resident. And you and I both got matters sort of dealing with those facts and. Oh. Um, and whether that how that falls into paragraph AD, so paragraph two. Um, you know, the, the, I, th I think both judgments accepted that that the purpose of paragraph eighty two was to embody the conduit principle in that section, just as twenty five B purpose of that is to embody the conduit principle in that section in relation, certainly now in relation to income. Um, but going back to paragraph 80, subparagraph 2, what about non-residents? Does it, uh, I mean, we know what SARS's argument is. SARS's argument mm. is that the trust must pay the tax. But, but uh, you know, if the, if the legislation is silent on it, surely the conduit principle still applies. Mm. Anyway, you know, those were not the facts. Can, can I, um, I've done a fair amount of work on this judgment. Can I, highlight certain aspects of the dissenting minority judgment. I think we've said enough to so people know what what we're what we if there are multi-tiered trusts. Um we know that it certainly now and I think the courts the judgments were unanimous that now after the 2020 amendments it has to be the trust that sold the asset that that um it's only its beneficiaries can be taxed. But um can can I just highlight certain aspects of the minority judgments, which I think are brilliant? And uh, you know, just just as when the constitutional court decides whether a mat whether they should hear a matter, is, is it of general public importance and significance? And they, you know, they 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 allowed it. Obviously, they granted leave to appeal in this matter, uh, and that's because its its importance wasn't limited only to this case, but it had a much wider significance. Well, I, I want to suggest that similarly, the judgment of the minority can have a 
much wider significance in relation to other matters that we haven't even hasn't even been thought about yet. If I can just, I mean, it's, it, there's too much involved to go through everything, I think. But but um, if I can just deal on some of the things, and one will see how how useful it is. Um, so I'm I'm focusing now on the minority judgment of Judge Bilchitz. He said uh, first you have to consider the the rules of statutory interpretation. Secondly, it was um, necessary to inter to deal with this in relation to what the constitutional court, the rules, the principles developed in relation to the rule of law. And then thirdly, it was necessary to in consider how these principles interacted with the contrafiscum rule in the constitutional era. So I really like the way that he's, he's put interpretation, rule of law, and contrafiscum all together. Um, and to me that that that's important and then and then he says one of the aspects of the rule of law which is important is the importance of rationality he said parliament was required to act rationally the constitutional requirement of rationality being an incident of the rule of law which was in turn in turn a founding value of the constitution the requirement to act rationally involved the following components a the legislature must not act arbitrarily be a legislative provision must seek to achieve a leg legitimate government purpose. And thirdly, there had to be a nexus between the legislative provision and the legitimate government purpose. So where possible, um, legis provisions in legislation should be interpreted so as to be rational and non-arbitrary. Then the minority judgment pointed out that in terms of section 25b, which relates to the income of a trust, that can be passed down through multi-tiered trusts. So why should it be different for capital gains? That He said that was arbitrary and, and irrational. And that's why he interpreted the, the way he did. Um, so he said that that rationality requirement of the rule of law tied in with the contrafiscum rule. Um, and this reasoning in relation to the rule of law provided a strong foundation for the contrafiscum rule. He said there was no excuse for arbitrary rules in the realm of taxation. Well, I'm sure you and I, that's, that's very much honored in the breach. Um, then he held that there was significant ambiguity in paragraph 82 when construed in the light of the applicable present principles and how it applied to multi-tier trust structures. That ambiguity was borne out by the differences between SARS and the legal opinions of senior tax advisors relied on by Thistle, as well as academic um, commentary. So, you know, they looked at all of that stuff and found divergent views. Um, he, he looked at Armstrong and Rosen and he said those cases were based on the fact that, um, you know, those laid down the, contra the, the, the conduit principle. But he said that what they were doing was, was um, looking at the substance of the situation. Now, <laughs> The, the, major, the majority judgment just looked on a technical interpretation of section 82 with reference to a 2008 uh, explanatory memorandum and said, well, that, that knocks it out. Um, they didn't grapple with any of the stuff that, that Bilchard seems to have grappled with. And in my opinion, uh, he does so very, very well. Um, he says something interesting in relation to the use of, of explanatory memorandum. If I can just read um, from this and then I'll maybe keep quiet uh, for a while. Much was made in the majority judgment um, of the 2008 explanatory memorandum, which it was claimed evinced a clear intention for the conduit to be stopped at the second tier trust. It seemed that limited weight should be placed on such a memorandum. The legislature was duty bound by the requirements of the rule of law to ensure that the legislation it passed was as clear as possible and enabled individuals to know how to order their affairs. The legislature was, was obliged in the legislative instrument itself to say what it meant and could not cure an ambiguity by relying on an explanatory memorandum. This was particularly so where there was very limited treatment of this issue in the explanatory memorandum. In particular, no explanation was given for, in the 2008 explanatory memorandum for the purpose of limiting the conduit principle or reasons for the differentiation in this regard between the taxation of capital gains and other monetary gains, that's 25b. 
the memorandum simply asserts that the legal position simply asserts the legal position it's, it seeks to arrive at without explaining the rationale for doing so, which ultimately should be the purpose of an explanatory memorandum. And he's put the word explanatory in inverted commas. And then he says, in in having said that, he says, where an explanatory memorandum fails to articulate the rationale for a provision, but simply in, asserts an interpretation thereof, the weight to be attached to such a document is very limited. Reference to such an explanatory memorandum alone cannot cure an ambiguity in the language and dislodge the need to interpret legislation in the light of the applicable interpretive principles and in a manner that preserves its constitutionality. So in other words, he's saying it's, it's, it's okay to look at an explanatory memorandum to see what the purpose of the legislation is. But it's not okay just to look and see what the explanatory memorandum says it means. And I think that's an important distinction. And he uh, reference is made to the Marshall case, also by the in I think the majority judgment. In that case, they said that the courts must not have regard to a, a SARS practice note because it offends the separation of powers between the executive and the the judicial arms of government. And I wrote something in the tax papers. Isn't that also true of an explanatory memorandum? And I think he he's he's clarified my thinking for me that that it's okay to look at an explanatory memorandum to see what the purpose is because we we're in, we're supposed to look at the purpose of a legislative provision from whatever is available. But but where it doesn't disclose a purpose and it simply um, says what what it's what it means, then. That's on a par with a with a, with a uh, with a SARS practice note. Again, I'm doing too much talking, but I I, I think there's a lot of meat in this minority judgment, and uh, it it shows, in my opinion, a very healthy constitutional approach to the thing, and it ties the rule of law and the contrafiscum rule together very nicely in a way that, to me, makes perfect sense. And it's quite Maybe nice. Just to... To, to see the, the two judgments going at each other, because the majority judgment also criticizes the dissenting judgment. Um, and I think that's healthy. <laughs> Peter, you were going to say something. And maybe just to talk a bit about jurisdiction. So, about this before, but it's interesting that when you go to the constitutional court, you have to argue jurisdiction and the merits in the same hearing, and the court is. Uh, considers jurisdiction and then it considers the merits and in order to found jurisdiction in the constitutional court your application needs to raise arguable points of general public importance and must and it must be in the interest of justice that leave to appeal is granted and there's a quite high bars to overcome and here the constitutional court held that the points of law are of general public importance because they apply to capital gains tax liability of trust in the multi-tiered trust structures. As we've yeah. said, it actually is a lot wider than that potentially if this judgment applies in relation to distributions to non-resident beneficiaries as well. But um, it did find that there was jurisdiction in relation to um, the, the matter. On the cross appeal, uh, which you mentioned, Eva, which related to the penalty issue, held that notwithstanding the public importance of determining the proper interpretation of a bona fide inadvertent error, it was not in the interest of justice to grant leave to appeal. And that was on the basis that there hadn't been any reasoned judgment on the issue from the preceding courts. So it's a pity in a way that the court held that it didn't have jurisdiction in relation to the issue of penalties and the expression of what a bona fide inadvertent error means. And just to remind everyone, there's no understatement penalty if the taxpayer made a bona fide inadvertent error. And the question is, what does that mean? So in SARS's view, that means, or well, that doesn't apply where there was what SARS calls deliberate tax planning. So if there's deliberate tax planning, SARS says there's no inadvertent bona fide inadvertent error. Uh, SARS argued that that means an unthinking mistake, like a, when you make a finger error, you add a zero, something like that. Um, and the case law on this, especially from the tax court, is that it refers to a bona fide inadvertent error, refers to an innocent misstatement resulting in an understatement, 
while acting in good faith. And Trev, as you alluded to, even though the court found it didn't have jurisdiction on this point, the majority judgment then gave quite a strong perspective, sort of favoring uh, the, the argument that if you act in a, in, a, in, a, in a reasonable way and you act in good faith and you've got an opinion and you rely on it and you believe that what you're doing is correct, that is a bona fide inadvertent error. Why is it an error? It's an error because the constitutional court ultimately found against you. But it doesn't mean that you um, that, that you were wrong, certainly at the time that you filled out your tax return. You acted in good faith. And um, there was uh, it was an, it was an innocent misstatement, if you like. So I think we're getting very close, Trevor, to sort of recognizing what a bona fide inadvertent error is. The court, the precedent on this, is sort of piling up. Yeah. Can can I read the, uh, from the notes I've got here? Um, SARS had based its case for understatement penalties on item three in the table, namely. Um, no reasonable grounds for the position for the tax position taken, or alternatively, item two, and that is reasonable care not taken in completing returns. Then the court said SARS bore the onus of proving the facts that would bring the understatement of thistle within either of these categories, but it had no reasonable prospects of discharging this onus. And if I can just read two paragraphs. In respect of item three, the tax position taken by Thistle in relation to the conduit principle had been one taken on legal advice. It may have been a tax position that the court found to be incorrect, but it could not be said to be a tax position which, which Thistle had had no reasonable grounds for taking. The tax position was not just reasonable, it was a tax position that had been upheld by the tax court in a recent judgment that engaged with the conduit principle and the relevant provisions of the Act. To his credit, SARS, counsel for SARS had declined to submit that there had been no reasonable grounds for the tax court to reach the conclusion it reached. In relation to item two, SARS argued that although Thistle had been advised on its tax position, the advice that Thistle received had pointed out that SARS held a contrary view. On this basis, SARS argued that if Thistle had taken reasonable care in completing its return, it would have ignored the advice given to it and followed the stated SARS position, which that advice expressly considered and rejected. This argument was based on the proposition that no taxpayer could act reasonably on advice that differed from SARS's statement of its interpretation of tax legislation. This argument would elevate SARS to the status of an authority that can decree the only reasonable interpretations of tax legislation, an untenable argument. And then he went on to discuss. So I, th I think there's quite a lot there that is favorable for, for taxpayers when it comes to, as you I say, take, taking so. position which SARS mm. might not agree with. That, that doesn't make it uh, not bona fide and inadvertent. As he said, a, a meaty judgment that touches on understatement penalties, it touches on the relevance of explanatory memoranda, it touches on the contrafiscum rule. As you say, a really strong minority judgment, and I think it's a, it's it's a very useful judgment to read through, even though, as you say, it's no longer applicable because of the change in law, the current current situations. But I thought a really a really interesting set of set of judgments, both the majority and the and the dissenting. Um, and no, no, I, I think I think the emphasis on the rule of law and the contrafiscum mm -hmm. and interpretational rules and the way it's all tied together, that can be applied in the future to other mm -hmm. situations. That's the use. Yeah. I agree with you then. I was going to talk about how you capitalize a trust, and I think we should hold it over for next time because I think we're a bit over time. But just as an as a as a spoiler alert or an appetite wetener, <laughs> the way that one typically capitalizes offshore trusts is through loans. Given what uh, clients, what we've been seeing from clients is that when interest rates were nice and low and you lent money to an offshore trust in dollars and there was a very low interest rate attached to it, life was good. Now interest rates have gone through the roof globally and suddenly capitalizing offshore trusts in US dollars or Swiss francs or whatever doesn't seem like such a good idea because you either have a huge amount of interest imputed to you or owing to you. So... Yeah. Look at ways of capitalizing a trust through an equity contribution as opposed to a loan. 
And I think next uh, podcast, we can maybe talk through that a little bit and just kind of how that all stacks out together. I would, and... I would, I would love to do that because I myself am very curious what you can <laughs> say about that. <laughs> I read read your article in the tax plan. I found it fascinating. The tax plan, want, that's pretty wanting cool. more. <laughs> that is more. I think that's our next Let's round. Do another yeah. podcast soon before the end of the year. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It's a pleasure as always, Trevor. Thanks for your insights. No, no, thank you. And uh, let's do it again soon. Thanks for that. Eh? Cheers, everyone. Right, bye bye. The Taxpayer is hosted by the editors of the Taxpayer Journal, Trevor Empley and Peter Dax. For more information on our journal and other products, please visit our website at taxpayer.co.za. Each of our episodes is CPD certified. To claim your CPD points, please visit our website. Thank you for listening to the Taxpayer Podcast. You can find more episodes on your favorite podcast platform or on our website at taxpayer.co.za. Please like and subscribe on YouTube and rate our podcast on your podcast platform of choice.